The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is Romans chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Righteousness Without Works. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for thy free grace to sinners, which makes it possible for us to approach thee with confidence knowing that thou hast dealt with our sins and wilt regard with favor those who come to thee through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we seek no other way, but turn from all other ways and come to thee in the name and for the sake of thine eternal and co-equal Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It is sometimes possible to know what people are doing by reading the laws that are passed to keep them from doing it. A historian can deduce something from the fact that more than 50 laws were passed in Athens over the course of a generation to restrain the citizens of that ancient city-state from slicing little pieces of silver from the edges of the coins of the city, minted in soft metal as they then were. In the same way, it is possible for us, theologically, to deduce from some of the attacks that were made on the great characters of the Bible the nature of their lives and actions and the nature of the doctrines which they held. Something also can be seen about the mental processes of those who made the attack. For example, on the day of Pentecost, the crowd accused the disciples of being drunk with new wine, a most intoxicating drink because they were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they spoke and acted with the deepest fervor and zeal. Such action, of course, is not to be confused with the counterfeit frenzy that comes from self-hypnosis or demons. And then again, the Lord Jesus Christ was accused of being possessed of a demon because he worked with such power. This accusation attests the fact of his miracles and shows the animosity of the minds that would stoop to such a criticism. Christ lashed out against it with the sharpest criticism of his entire ministry, saying that such confusion would not be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. God will permit no debasing of the deity of his Son. In our study of the Epistle to the Romans, we come to an attack which was made on the doctrine preached by Paul the Apostle, and the nature of the attack reveals precisely the truth that he taught. Now, nothing shows more clearly the true meaning of salvation by grace than the charge of immoral tendency brought against it. There have been some who have taught that salvation by grace means that God works in the heart to make us disposed to do his will, and in consequence of that good disposition, he saves us. If such had been the teaching of the New Testament, No one would ever have slanderously reported that Paul was preaching that men should do evil that good might come. Still others have taught that salvation by grace means that God saves us on the basis of good works, which he comes to help us do. But again, no charge of immoral tendency would ever have been brought against any such teaching. It is impossible to conceive that any charge could be brought against such theories that they were conducive to moral laxity. But if Paul's doctrine was that righteousness without works is set down by God as a bookkeeping transaction to the account of the ungodly who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is easy to see how a handle might be made of this to make it appear as an encouragement to sin that grace may abound. And the undoubted fact is that throughout the long history of Christian theology, the latter doctrine of righteousness set down to the account of the ungodly who believes has always been charged with having an immoral tendency and that the other explanations of the doctrine have never been so charged. It is evident then that the doctrine of free grace to the ungodly on the grounds of faith in Christ Jesus alone is what the New Testament teaches. We shall have frequent occasion to return to this truth in our exposition of the coming chapters. Now I can comprehend the thought of Paul by looking into my own experience and understanding the bitter reactions to my preaching of this doctrine 
which have confronted me throughout my lifetime. One instance brings great joy to my heart. I began to broadcast over one local station in Philadelphia. Radio was in its infancy, and there was not one other Bible-centered program on the air in our city. I preached the gospel and the doctrine of free grace, and it hit many people in the city as a strange thing. I set forth the gospel in such terms that one old theologian wanted to know exactly what I did believe. There was a beloved minister who is now alive forevermore, who was concerned lest I might be teaching this immoral tendency. He was dear old Dr. David Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy invited me to luncheon. After we had given our orders to the waitress, Dr. Kennedy said, young man, I have been listening to you preach and I'm concerned with what you're saying. Are you setting forth that as long as one believes in Christ, there is no bondage to righteousness? I saw immediately what had disturbed him and I replied, Dr. Kennedy, I can set your mind at rest in one sentence. I preach the Augustinian, Paulinian, Abrahamic doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, apart from any righteousness of man. My position is halfway between Galatianism on the one hand and antinomianism on the other hand. Now, to the mind that is not theologically trained, I'll repeat the sentence in non-theological language. I stated that my position was opposed to the doctrine that Paul had fought in Galatia, where there was the belief that there could be no saving faith without a continuance of rites and ceremonies such as circumcision and the keeping of the ceremonial law. But in opposing such legalism, I did not allow the pendulum to swing to the opposite side, where one might infer that there are no demands of personal holiness in the Christian life. I'm convinced that if the true doctrine of salvation has been received by any sinner, there will be the immediate entry of the divine life into his being, and that from that instant, there will be a sharp change in his life that will lead him on and on into practical righteousness and holiness. Anything else is a travesty on Christian truth and doctrine. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all so that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. But in setting forth my position to Dr. Kennedy over that luncheon table, I had used theological language to him, a theologian, stating simply that my position was halfway between Galatianism and antinomianism, between legalism and license. I can see him yet, a smile breaking forth on his face as he said, what a pleasure to listen to someone who knows exactly what he is talking about and who will set it forth so plainly. He then went on to say that he had listened very carefully to my broadcasts and that he knew that I had spoken so sharply against legalism that he was afraid I would take the false reaction of the antinomian, the man who believes in license rather than in Christian liberty. But his mind was now at rest and he rejoiced in my testimony. I tell this story because it explains my text. My preaching, which is the light of one candle, produced proportionately the same criticism as Paul's preaching, which is the light of the sun. A few years ago, there was an organization in this country with offices in New York, which was known as the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. They published anti-Christian literature, and I ordered their list in order to study their arguments. On the flyleaf of one volume, which was a long diatribe against the Bible, scraping together every argument that has ever been brought against any part of the Word of God, there was written our text from Romans 3, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Now, the skeptic in that book had taken this verse out of its context and attempted to make it stand for the exact opposite of that which Paul is teaching. The devil is a liar and the father of it, and the father of lies, as we read in John 8, 44. 
All that Paul is doing here in this text is to apply the false question of the preceding verse to himself to show how ridiculous their charge had been. Paul is demonstrating that their claim to immunity from divine judgment rests on a fallacy. There is sin in the world, and God is going to get glory out of the fact that there is sin. You are forced to conclude then that good is a product of evil, or that God is holy and will judge sin absolutely. Paul is refuting the idea that good can come out of evil and is proclaiming the fact that God will judge the world in righteousness and that even religious pretenders will be brought under the stroke of the divine wrath. Various commentators have paraphrased this sentence to make it more clear. Newell states it, If God's truth as to his warnings and promises was enhanced through my falsity, if he got glory through my sin, why does he find fault with me as a sinner? Calvin paraphrases the passage in yet another way, which brings forth the same truth. He shows that the statement is a sort of explanation of the former verse and would have been connected with it had not the apostle moved with indignation broken off the sentence in the middle. The meaning of the objection is, if by our unfaithfulness the truth of God becomes more conspicuous, and in a manner confirmed, and hence more glory redounds to him, it is by no means just that he who serves to display God's glory should be punished as a sinner. And the dead silence following such a sentence would say, how ridiculous. And do you think to hide behind such a flimsy folly in the day when the searching light of God penetrates the hearts of all men to render their deeds and thoughts naked before the universe? Before we take the eighth verse and complete the answer of Paul to the scandalous charge that had been made falsely against his teaching, it might be well to point out that there have been movements within the body of Christendom against whom this charge should have proved true. For there exists among us an organization whose very name has become synonymous with chicanery, and it is one of the most powerful organizations in the world, a religious order known in history, and even under its name in the dictionary, as believing that the end justifies the means. Evil has frequently been done by this group, that good, according to their definition, might come. Now such a work is of necessity satanic, no matter what its outward signs, symbols, or confessions. Ultimately, a group that proceeds on the basis that the end justifies the means will have a satanic end as well as a satanic means. It is simply impossible for good to proceed from evil. We must never be deceived by apparent good, for apparent good is sometimes the most evil of all evil. And this truth should be applied to our everyday life as we consider that the end never justifies evil means. There are frequent arguments as to whether a lie is ever justifiable, and the answer is that it is not. There are moments when an individual must refuse to speak, and his silence can be interpreted in many ways by those who wish to interpret it, but he must not speak the lie. And there are moments when silence would be the lie, and only the bold speaking of truth would serve the ends of truth. Let me construct a story that will illustrate this. I recall a conspiracy of lies in a certain home to keep from a dying woman the knowledge that she had cancer and was dying. Those around her were going to extravagant means to tell her of plans for her vacation the following year and how she would be well soon. When I came into the home, they attempted to brief me with their story and expected me to carry on with their methods. I asked them that I might talk to the woman alone. When I had prayed with her, I held her by the hand and said, You know that your days are numbered, do you not? And that you are a dying woman? She held my hand a long moment in silence and said, I have suspected it, but they keep putting me off with stories that are becoming fanciful. Do you want to know the truth, I asked. Of course I want to know the truth, she answered. Well, I replied, the doctor says you have an inoperable cancer, 
and that it is spreading with great rapidity. She nodded her head and said, I have suspected it for some time, but they protested so much I wasn't sure. It'll be a whole lot better living with reality than with suspicion. After a while, I went out into the other room and told the family that I had told the loved one that she was dying. There was a moment of horror on their faces, and one of them said, How can I go in and face her? Now that was a confession of moral cowardice, which was the real reason for the lie. When we all went back into the sick room, there were tears from the bystanders, but none from the woman herself. She had already arisen in moral stature above them all, and had faced her life and its approaching end, and knew that there was nothing for her to fear, since she was resting in Christ, whose perfect love casts out all fear. When they asked her if there was anything she wanted, she replied with a vigorous, Yes, keep that radio shut off so that I can pray and meditate when I want to. And that was the end of it, or rather, that was the beginning of several months of high triumph. Our text now closes with the statement that the damnation of a certain group is just. Read the text carefully, for there is included in it more than the fact that those who believe that the end justifies the means are condemned by God. The damnation that is announced here is for those who slander Christian doctrine. Christ is the truth, and ultimately God will not permit his truth to be the object of lies. Think of that the next time you hear anyone say that God would not be just if he sent one of his creatures to hell. Think of that the next time you hear the righteousness of God attacked because someone does not think it right that a loving God should not overlook all iniquity and take everyone into his heaven. Think of that the next time you hear anyone attack the doctrine of free, sovereign grace on the ground that it is an infringement on the dignity of human personality. Think of that the next time you hear someone say that the doctrine of justification will lead men to sin more freely, or that the doctrine of our eternal security in God will lead to laxity in Christian living. The disputer in all such cases is arguing against God and his righteous plan. His condemnation is just. For the day of condemnation will come, as we have abundantly shown in previous studies, and one of the items that will be brought up for settlement at the judgment bar of God will be all of the attacks that have been made on Christian doctrine. How important becomes the verse in Isaiah's prophecy, which protects every biblical Christian from all attacks on Christian truth. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shalt thou condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I have purposely inserted a comma in the passage to make the meaning clearer. I do not think the verse means merely that every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall be condemned at the time of the rising by the believer. Rather does it mean that every tongue that shall rise against us shall be condemned in the ultimate day of judgment by our being joined to the judge in the giving of the decision. That is why it is so easy to allow oneself to be lied about for the sake of the Lord. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Someone lies about you or your doctrine today? Rest patiently in the Lord. The day will come when he shall put his arm around you and draw you to the seat of honor on the judgment bench of eternity and will bring your accuser before you and you will sit on the throne of God while your present accuser will stand in the seat of the condemned and will be forced to acknowledge his wrong before he is sent to the lake of fire. This is the meaning of that verse in Revelation where we read, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are God's people and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. The men who reviled Noah will be forced to stand before God and Noah and then to bow before God 
before they are sent to the lake of fire. The men who killed the prophets will be forced to stand before God and the prophets and will be thrust to their knees before they are sent to the lake of fire. Inquisitors will bow before God and their victims. Slanderers will bow before God and the objects of their lies. Modernistic leaders who have vilified saints of God because of their fundamental positions on theological truth will bow before God and the faithful upholders of truth. And while there is no biblical authority whatsoever for what I am now about to say, if I may use my imagination for one moment, as Dante did in his description of hell, I would not be astonished if each and every inmate of the lake of fire had wounds on their knees forever from the force of the crushing blow when their high pride was abased and they were crushed to the stones of fire that are before the throne of God before being sent to their eternal doom. There's a great day coming. There's a great day coming. It's going to be a great day. Yes, it is. Therefore, stand fast. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And Lord our God and Father, put true fear into the hearts of unbelievers as they consider the realities of truth and judgment. And fill the hearts of those who have become thy children through Christ with a confidence that shall make them walk humbly, but with holy boldness before thee. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake, amen.